folks coming in. So I want to welcome everyone and thank you for signing up for our Exploring the Textile Arts series. My name is Howard Wooden and I'm a WS Client Service Manager here in Vermont. You're going to experience a wonderful exploration today. And today we're talking about quilt, having a quilting discussion. But before we get to it, I just want to tell you a little bit about WS and some of the things that are happening here. If you don't know us, we're an innovative nonprofit organization, a global firm that, oper firm that operates in over 60 locations in the US alone. We connect individuals from underserved populations with transformative career opportunities in all types of fields, from mechanics to Java developers and much more, a lot of tech stuff we do. We uh, have a lot of different types of uh, clients too. It's amazing the number of clients that we're adding all the time. We also provide free training through our in the community initiatives. And right now the Workforce Essential Workshop empowers individuals to move from entry level positions to long lasting professional success. It's a three hour a day workshop for four consecutive days. If you know somebody that could use that, or you yourself might be interested, let us know. We have another workshop that's coming up very soon. It's gonna start in May, May 16th and 19th. So, and that's a 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, workshop. So there's plenty of time to sign up for that or to refer somebody for it. Also our next visual art series um, with Helen Lee is going to be starting on Wednesday, May 11th. That'll be a six to seven, almost very similar to this. Uh, Helen is one of our most popular presenters and we've, we're just getting that one organized and you'll see a, a remarkable four part series coming up there. Today's the second of our three hour sessions on textile arts and uh, we're, we're, we can't tell you how grateful and honored we are to have Laura as well as Michelle with us. Uh, next week is a hands-on workshop, and we're going to be giving you the uh, materials if you want to participate and actually help and start a, a quilt and learn how to do some quilting. We're going to give those materials out during this workshop quite often in the chat. So check the chat quite often. You'll see those materials there, and we'll make sure that there is a list there that you can. It's very simple. You can, Most of the things you can get right around the house, but if you have to go out, it, they're inexpensive and you should be able to participate. So be a good chance to bring in a loved one too. If you have children or grandchildren that you wanna um, um, introduce to quilting, next week might be a great way to do it because you're gonna get some of the, you're gonna get experts that can uh, introduce this to you. We also have um, a survey that we're going to give you at the end of this workshop that kind of gives us some feedback on how we're doing with the workshops. And it's very important to us to get your feedback and your opinion on things. Throughout this session, we, we love your participation, but we're, um, Laura will be uh, discussing or presenting for about 45, 50 minutes, and then she'll open it up for questions and uh, comments. But if you have a burning question, you can put it into the chat. Uh, Amy and I will be monitoring, uh, mostly Amy will be uh, monitoring the chat, and, um, and we'll try to sneak in a question if we have to. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about our presenter tonight, uh, Laura Gadsen. Uh, quilt fiber and mixed media artists, Laura Gadsen has explored various art mediums, including slip casting, stained glass, and artistic fabric dyeing during the course of her career. Quilting has been her primary medium of artistic expression since 2001. She is a graduate of the renowned Fiorella LaGuardia High School of Music and holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the City College of New York. Her work has been exhibited in various institutions, including the New York State Museum in Albany, the Visions Museum of San Diego, California, and the Historical Society of Washington, D.C., to name a few. And her quilt designs have been displayed as banners on, on Harlem's 125th Street in 2009, 2010, and 2012. Ms. Gadsden's artwork is in the private collections of such notables as Dr. Carolyn Maslumi, Susan Taylor, and Ilana I I Van Zant, as well as the institution collections of Morris Jumel Mansion and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Most recently, Ms. Gadsden was part of the three artist team commissioned to create the legacy quilt, um, part of the, I think it's the um, I forgot what MOFAD stands for. Do you Museum remember? What? 
Right. Um, part of the group Public Installation Up South, and she is currently developing a body of work entitled The Water Brought Us. Um, I'm going to, as you can tell, her list of credits and accomplishments go on and on, but I don't want to take up too much of her time. So take it away, Laura. Good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Gadsden. I am an, just a creative being. I explore all kinds of things. Many of them are in textiles. Some of them have been in glass and sometimes I will fuse them all together. Um, uh, behind me, you can see a piece that's part of that series, uh, The Water Brought Us. And um, it is a quilt. Um, but tonight we're gonna be doing, uh, talking about uh, something I put together called Pieced Existence, Existences and Patchworked Dreams. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit more about why I did this. What we're gonna be exploring some 20th and 21st century quilters. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, how they began their craft, uh, what part of their culture it's a part of. Um, I'm gonna be presenting three distinctly American communities of color. That, is, that are associated with their unique style of patchwork, which is a little bit different than quilting, but it's all related. Uh, patchwork sewing or quilting who have a level of economic success through that endeavor. Okay, so we're gonna be uh, looking a little bit at the Seminole Native American tribe of Florida, because there are Seminoles uh, in Mexico and um, in Oklahoma, I believe. Uh, the quilters of G's Bend, Alabama. And they have received some notoriety because they've had exhibits that have gone all throughout major institutions in the country from about 2002 until now. And um, some modern urban quilt artists uh, from the Northeastern United States, basically people that I know and that have had some level of success with them doing this as artists, not just craftspeople, but as artists and not artisans, artists that are auctioned in art galleries and so forth. So we're gonna start off with um, my, uh, we, this is my first, we're gonna go on to the slide of my uh, self-portrait. So um, what qualifies me to present this? Well, I've been doing quilting. I've sewn all my life. I'm a second generation sewer. I'm a, a second generation also artist. My dad was a craft, I was a draftsman and a painter. Uh, this, this is in my, this is my love. And I tend to research things depending on what I'm interested at the time. Uh, my affiliations, I'm part of a, um, a quilt group that's also been quilting for 20 years, Harlem Girls Quilting Circle. Just some regular folks. Our biggest thing that linked us before we started quilting was the fact that a lot of us studied African dance, West African dance, here in Harlem. Um, the, uh, I felt like, you know, I wanted to do this because a lot of times, you know, when stories of artists are told, they may not be from that community of artists. And I felt that I, I was kind of likened to these communities I'm gonna talk about. And so it's nice for me to present it from my side or my point of view. And I'm gonna describe the quilting process to you. All right, so when we talk about quilting, the end result generally for quilting is something that is generally three layers. It is a top layer, which is your fancy, whatever your artistry is on top, your bottom layer, and something in the middle to make it stuffing. So in these days, that is used as an, a way of creating art, but traditionally mo most people understand it as something that you put on your bed. Uh, that's why the stuffing is in the middle. That's, that's the warmth part of this. And the two pieces were to hold it together because though we have sheets of stuffing now that we can just buy and put on in between, we, uh, um, we uh, oh my goodness, what's that? There we go. Um, we, uh, uh, it used to be that you had just little pieces of, paper or straw or something in between. So um, that's quilting. The quilting is actually the process of stitching. So if you look at my self-portrait from many years ago, 2007, you will see stitching kind of on either the right or left side in a light green. Um, as an urban quilter, I rely a lot on my sewing machine to do a lot of things that many people might have, have done in the past by hand, or sometimes they will prefer to do it by hand. Um, so now to get this beautiful quilt top, there are two ways I've done it. I have sewn fabric to fabric. 
That's what we call piecing. You take pieces of fabric and you put them together. Or you can do something called applique, which means you put fabric on top of fabric. So if you see the rendering of my face and my body, those were appliques that I, that I first fused on in an ironing process. Then I stitched them on and then I embellished them that you can see with the hair with some stitching. The X is quilting as well, but it also embellishes the idea of hair going in different directions. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the piecing first because um, my first group is gonna be the uh, Seminole, the Seminole Indians. But before we talk about their journey specifically to them and their culture, um, I just want folks to remember that um, as far as culturally, uh, not just in this country, you know, Bridgerton is very popular now as a series on Netflix. And you, you, if you're looking into the series, you will see that there's that idea of having to marry someone in order to situate yourself as a female, as a woman, you had to marry a male. So again, remember Europe is here, comes here to the Americas and those things carry with them. So, you know, if you know your American history, you know, women, women of any color could not vote, women could not uh, own land, you know, women weren't expected to necessarily work outside the house unless they had to because of, you know, impoverished, and more or less those were people of a lower standard that had to do those kinds of things. And in the higher classes, sewing and needleworks, those were thought of as things that cultured a woman. Uh, here you have a, a, a picture, I'm gonna say, judging by their garments and the sewing machine, that they, um, this is about the Edwardian era, about 1900, 1910. Um, uh, let's see what else we can say about this. And I want you to also, if you can see that sewing machine, you'll notice that that is a treadle sewing machine. That is a sewing machine before electri electricized sewing machines were popular. And so those women are learning to sew and they have to pedal that with their feet. I actually own a 1917 treadle and I keep it and try to keep it in working order in case the lights go out, I can still do a little bit of my art with that, you know, so I have that here. All right, so we're gonna go to our first group of, of, of uh, community, which are the Seminole, the Miccosukee people that are uh, located, this group, this group of them is located in Florida. And they have not a quilting style because if you think of indigenous people as creating things for their environment, you know, they're in a warmer environment, they do not need to have a quilt. But what they did do is have embellished outfits, highly embellished outfits, and they created a particular style of strip quilting. So they're only really cutting strips of fabric, but they are sewing them, cutting them, and then re-sewing them together and making patterns similar to the background of this. So I'm gonna introduce you to them by a picture now. We're going on to the picture of the Seminole people. These are postcards. And one of the things that interests me most recently about the Seminoles is the idea of people, let's say pre the 20th and 21st century, you think of them doing quilting more for, or piecing, no, excuse me, not quilting, piecing, putting little pieces of fabric together because they didn't have the money. This is what's true of some people in India known as the Siddhi. They are a poorer set of people in India. They collect old saris and they have a particular style of putting things together because they're using pieces of fabric. The Bifal people of Africa, they're in Senegal. They have a particular way of putting things together because whatever the tailors in their area get rid of, they patch that together and they've created their own style of garments for that. But it was different for these Seminoles. The Seminoles have a long standing history in the United States. They are actually a confederacy of some tribes. Uh, Seminoles might speak one of two or three different languages. And they come about as uh, one group called the Seminole uh, as America is forming and native, natives are getting pushed to the West and getting pushed to the South. It starts when the United States does not own Florida yet. I'm going to give you the picture. Well, before we get to the picture of the map, I just want you to take a look at their garments. Uh, you see the one on the left side is, is a little bit different than the one on the right. I can tell it's from a younger era 
in the Seminoles existence and doing this kind of work because it's got less embellishment on it. Some years later, they started heavily embellishing that. And some of that is due to the invention and the ability for them to get their hands on sewing machines. Right now, if I taught you the Seminole technique of patchwork, you wouldn't want to do it by hand. You would want to do it by machine because it makes it easier to cut and put things together. Uh, uh, hand sewn piecing is not as durable as machine sewn pieces if you're going to cut, if you're going to start cutting them. So uh, of course the address change as, the, as they are inter interacting with Europeans. And um, so now they're completely covered and you see this little cape style over the women's shoulders. Um, uh, they, uh, they would embellish that. And then the men wore skirts as well because being in the Everglades and being in the water, you know, a shorter garment for the men was, was, um, was perfect. And these men uh, uh, and, and this group of people, um, they also had the women as being the sewers and the men as the other. Okay, I'm sure that's some an interloper. <laughs> All right, so now going to the next slide is the map of, um, of Florida. So um, if you see Mikasuki in a little triangle at the top of the first mass map, um, map on the left, you will see that, that that was before European encroachment on the different lands. Before the United States owns Florida, that would have been some uh, Seminole area, the Miccosukee, or is close to their original name. And above them, they were in also in Georgia and in Alabama, I believe. If you look at the map on the right, they are uh, now they have about five or six reservations in Florida. The uh, one where their main camp is, is in Hollywood, Florida, which is near Southern, uh, uh, the very tip of the peninsula of Florida. And um, they started doing their patchwork after a couple of wars transpired. They're getting pushed down. They're hiding in the Everglades for about a hundred years before they resurface again. And by the time they resurface again, uh, uh, European missionaries, are, are talking with them and encouraging them to do their different crafts in, uh, uh, in with the patchwork so that they can sell them for tourists, for tourism. And that's when they really start to take off with their patchwork. So their pat they had patchwork and embellishment via sewing prior to that time, but in this era of being now part of a tourist attraction, which they still are. Um, I'm not sure what the big drawer, how big the drawer is now. And I'll talk a little bit about how that all ends up for them later. Okay, so we're going on to the next slide where we have Black Seminoles. So part of the legacy of the Seminole tribe is uh, Native Americans, as they're getting pushed down to the South, uh, they are adopting some of the ways of the Europeans. So if they're doing crops and things for sale, some Native American tribes had slaves. Now, the Seminole tended not to do that, they, in, they kind of invited in runaway slaves, free blacks into their community. They didn't really just meld and mesh though there was some intermarriage, but those Africans adopted a lot of their, uh, uh, their uh, way of dressing, some of their ways of eating, some of their ways of living. So if you see the, uh, the picture to the left, that's an older picture that is more vintage picture. And a picture that's closer to today, you can see theirs is not the pat, they don't have as much patchwork. Um, from what I understand, a lot of the black Seminoles, not all, but a lot of them, they followed that trail of tears going to Oklahoma. And when they were not received well by the different Native American nations there, they, a lot of them went on to Mexico. So there is a Seminole a native Seminole group in Mexico. Okay, next slide, we're going to see the sewing machine. Now, if you check the sewing machine out, this is not the treadle, but if you wanted to get sewing machines into more rural parts of the country, you had a hand cranked one. And you can see this is also a tourism postcard. And this is a Seminole woman uh, sewing her patchwork on that, that sewing machine. My next slide 
you will see uh, a slightly more modern version. The cape has been changed into a transparent cape. And you still see uh, the first young lady is, has a little bit more traditional or older design, also takes less time. And the second lady to the right, each one of those layers is a set of piecing. So that is patchwork. You could take that same patchwork, use it for your quilt top and make a quilt out of it. You can take it and make it into garments. But each color you see on the jacket on the right is a different piece of fabric and the shapes are achieved by sewing different shapes together. And now I'm gonna show you how you put those shapes together. We are not gonna do this style because as I said, this, this style works best these days by machine. But we're gonna start from one. They start out with strips. All they're doing is sewing strips together. They'll sew long, long strips together. Then they'll cut those strips in a number of different shapes. But for this particular run, they're cutting them, uh, they sewed them horizontally. So the red fabric, the blue fabric, and the white fabric are now one piece. And in number two, you see, now they're cutting it up into long rectangles. Number three, you see them taking those rectangles instead of sewing them back together just that way, Another design could be they flip it so the red is on the bottom one time, the white is, and then the white is back on the bottom. But in this particular design, they're sewing them so those blues become a diamond. So they've sewn them so they're just to the side. They're a little askew, but they're in a straight row. So you see how that would start out. We're gonna go over to the next graphic. And 4B, you see how you would start out by sewing two pieces together. And then you would sew four, you know, you sew those two pieces together, and then you would end up with a long strip as you see in 4C. So 4C and 4A are two illustrations of basically the same thing occurring. When you get to number five, you see you chop off and make a just one row of um, of uh, uh, fabric, and by number six you see a strip. So now when you saw those ladies garments, it's just different strips that they've made over time and those strips would all be put together. So now in the next slide, in their culture, the different patterns those strips would make might denote different things. I don't know that they necessarily tell a story, but the patterns have been given names of things that were, that they, that, that, that were present in their mind all the time. Something called fire something called lightning. Uh, 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 one might be called the name of, of something that you see. I see something there named turtle. There's another one called bird. But all of those patterns that you see there were made in some similar way just by putting those pieces together differently and assembling them all back differently. You would get any of these patterns here and there are even more of these. So now in the next slide, I'm just gonna show you um, the seminal piecing technique the left side is a graphic. That's just a graphic of how you can put that together. The right side is someone who's actually taken those and made it into a quilt top. So now once you have your quilt top, now you have the on one of which I'm gonna consider the first piece of your quilts. You would then take and find a piece of fabric or back, it might be another quilt top or it might be a plain piece of fabric. You would put and sandwich that with a piece of batting or stuffing in the middle. So you have your top, your bottom, and your middle makes a sandwich. And the quilting, by definition, is really the stitching that keeps those three together. So I just tell you that as you might be somebody that's going to explore the piecework with me next week, we will not be quilting. We will be doing the piecework because that's the first part that usually happens, the piecing. The piecing or the applique, but we're going to be doing piecing. Okay, in our next slide, this is a piece called Seminolfrica that I made in 2009. It was part of an exhibition that I did with my quilt group Harlem Girls Quilting Circle. Uh, and we were gifted by one of, our, one of our associates that had been to Africa, particularly Nigeria. And they came back with this traditional fabric woven in Nigeria called Ashoke. Ashoke is, uh, you see the, the, the plain purple fabric is Ashoke. Actually, most of the fabric in here is a showcase, except for where you see those little square shaped spirals. 
So I call this Seminophica because those spirals were made in the technique of the Seminoles. And also where you see the diamonds in the middle, the middle panel, you see down a few little green diamonds, actually one full one and a couple of pieces of diamonds. That is another uh, piece that is done. I actually added in some embroidery in that. And it was made with the idea of if the Africans that were enslaved were allowed to pack a bag and they had fabric, what might their, their, their piecework that was uh, when, they, when some of them were in partnership with the Seminoles, what might that look like? It might have some of their fabric from home in it. So that's my little, that was my little ode to both the Seminoles and those Africans that were a part of them at one point in time. All right, so that's my, my introduction to the Seminoles. Now, what I'm Excuse gonna tell me. you about- Sorry, yes. Laura, sorry to interrupt. Sure. Uh, it looks like, I think the slides are advancing differently. So I just wanna make sure that everybody's seeing, I'm sorry, the, your quilt right now, on yes. the screen because okay, I saw so we'll some- we'll stay there for a second. We'll stay there for a second because I wanted to talk about the economics. Okay. Um, Can besides everyone, this... oh, I'm sorry, give me one second. Mm -hmm. Not seeing next slide. I just wanna make sure everybody can see. If anyone is not seeing Laura's quilt right now. Mm -hmm. And it will please... have my name on it. Laura R. Gatson is on that slide. If you're not seeing that, I guess, um, let us okay. know. All right. I guess everyone is on point. Okay. We're good. So All right. uh, one more thing I wanted to say about as far as economics and this particular style, th this, this style of patchwork is, is now a real identity thing for the, uh, the Seminoles. It always was. You won't see them wearing the beaded necklaces as much anymore, but this is the thing that they use as that identifies them from every other Native American tribe. Uh, the, um, so they were doing it uh, in different parts as something for tourism. They really honed it. It is beautiful. Um, but what they're finding now as Native American tribes have, have uh, fought and won more recognition from the United States government and in the idea of them being able to do gaming on their different reservations. And I know on the Seminole, uh, one Seminole uh, reservation, those people get dividends from the gaming institution. So each, each person that's a member of their reservation gets dividends. And you're finding that now in the idea of affluence, not as many people want to do the patchwork because it's not a necessity anymore. You would have to get somebody who either want is very interested in quilting or patchwork or somebody that's very interested in holding their culture. So now you know that with young people, that can be a difficult thing in anybody in anybody's uh, uh, a culture. It's hard to hold young people back from moving forward to say we need to preserve this. So, there, so, so there are some that are a little uh, in despair about we, you know, we now, you know, it's a good thing that we have money now, but it's also bad that now we're going to lose a piece of our own our own identity here. So that's that's the idea of when I say. Uh, Endeavors of the economics, you know, sometimes, you know, money is not always good. Money, does, money has all sides to it, just like a lot of things do. And so we'll see how that, that progresses. All right, so now we're going on to the next slide. We're going to start looking at the women of G's Bend. Okay. G's Bend is a very rural, offset part of the United States. It is on a peninsula that is, on, that is really easiest gotten to. Boykin County, Alabama, uh, via, what is it, uh, ferry. Okay, next slide. Here is a picture of their, um, where they are. Geez, Ben is somewhere near the, um, near the, uh, what is it, the water. And you see a little red arrow. That's where a ferry was. There was a ferry, they, 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 they actually had their ferry restored in 2006 but they were missing their ferry from 1962 until about sometime uh, in, the two, in, in, in the 21st century uh, because they were visited by Martin Luther King. He came there, he inspired them to, uh, you know, to, to uh, uh, seek their voting rights 
people would come across the ferry and, and, and do the different kind of protests, no matter how peaceful they were. And, and there was, and all of a sudden the ferry went out of repair. The, all of a sudden the ferry couldn't work anymore. So in order for those people to go on those protests, they would have to go all the way around the Alabama river to get all the way over right underneath where you see G's Bend underneath that would be, uh, what my God, it's, I can't remember what part of Alabama, but that's where some protests were being done. So they have caught, I will say they'll just lack a bit of it. They've caught hell for a long time because being detached from them kept them away from food sources, education sources, all kinds of things. I'm gonna show you next slide. Here's a slide of the ferry up until 1962. It really is not even a ferry. It is really like a raft. Um, and so um, next slide is, um, these uh, is, a, is a slide from 1937. Um, uh, there are a couple of photo photographers by different organizations. Some of them that were government paid that went and documented uh, these ladies and their quilt work. So, uh, um, so we have some pictures of descendants of some of the quilters I'm gonna show you. And so uh, Lucy Mingo, I think has passed on now. And of course, uh, Lucy Mooney, who, who's back you see here and her granddaughter is holding the top of her quilt. She's probably doing some piecing to that larger piece to make it the full size of the quilt. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, we see some women sewing on the porch. Definitely, you know, uh, they sewed out of necessity. So now this is the flip side of that. They sewed predominantly starting out as necessity. They didn't have access to a lot of things. Every piece of fabric had to become something else after its first purpose. And a lot of times the work clothes and different other clothes um, would go into making these quilts. I don't have a denim because they're known for some of their denim quilts, but this is what they did for survival. The children, um, let me see. Uh, I think we met Loretta Petway. I mean, might've met Mary Lee Bendolph. I had the privilege of being part of a, a Harlem Needle Arts hosting those ladies when they had their stamp in 20, 2005, I think it was. And um, so, and I am a big fan of Mary Lee Bendolph. Uh, she is the one on the right sitting at the bottom. And we're gonna go over to the next slide. And uh, this is Mary Lee Bendolph's work. So now in, there was a gentleman um, by the name of uh, William Arnett, Bill Arnett. He's, he is a lover and collector and also uh, made money from uh, having uh, control of rural artist artwork, not just quilters, but some other rural artists. Um, uh, he it was the one who exposed the world to these ladies and their work and how much though they were making these as utilitarian items, you see that this is modern art at, you know, in its idea of what modern art can look like. Um, so I, I love Mary Lee Bendall's stuff. Um, there's still, she's still putting it together in the idea of piecing. And uh, if you look at both the right and the left side, each one of those colors is a different fabric. If you notice they are different shapes, all of them are not straight shapes. Um, and what you don't see, that is that you know about usual quilts is that you don't see one pattern repeated. When we think of an American quilt, you think of one pattern repeated, that one pattern may make a bigger design, but these women, and probably out of the way their artwork or their craft work uh, uh, evolved, they didn't have the luxury of doing that all the time. Sometimes you couldn't finish a quilt till, you, till there was some more fabric found. There's one story that when somebody found an old dirty something in the street, came home, brushed it off, washed it off, it, be, it became part of a quilt that they were trying to finish because they had run out of fabric for that quilt. Um, um, I uh, am happy to say that um, one thing positive that occurred out of this discovery, and by discovery, I'm, I'm using that term for lack of a better word in my head right now, discovery of them and their work. Because the first quilts that uh, uh, Bill Arnett took from, uh, didn't take, but he bought from them, he purchased for little to nothing. And they were the things that these women would have done, gonna discard. They were using them to cover over wood piles and they might've been something just to make the bed extra fluffy. These were not their best work in their eyes, but 
uh, Arnett being a lover of art and being astute in art, he saw the value in it. And these ladies have, have had shows at places like the Whitney Museum in New York. Uh, the, there's a museum in, in Texas. They've had a bunch of exhibitions that have gone from today all the way back until I think 2002. So we're gonna move in quickly through that because we could talk about each one of these things in themselves could be a, their own thing, could be their own thing. All right, Claudia Petway is somebody I just recently discovered. And the Petway name is, uh, is, is a very well-known name to G's Ben. G's Ben, Joseph G's was the first person that I think on record of owning that piece of land, that peninsula. He then sold it to a man less, whose last name was Petway and Petway had a cotton plantation there. And he, and these Petways, all the Petways are not blood relation because once he brought all, um, he, he absorbed some of the, uh, the Africans that were there working for uh, um, Joseph G's and between the Africans that he brought to, uh, 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 that were slaves of his, he named them all last name Petway. So, so there are pet ways that are blood relations, there are pet ways that are not, but they, but the pet way is a name that you will see a lot in G's Bend. Um, and Claudia is someone who is, you know, younger than a lot of the women who have been um, uh, uh, from, uh, put out there on the front line of showing what G's Bend quilting can be. Uh, she's modern day. And one of the ways you can tell she's modern day, because I'm looking at her very nice quilt, very similar aesthetic. However, you don't see as much quilting in it because one thing about the older women of G's Ben, a lot of their stuff, it may not all be, but a lot of it is hand done. Some of them are hand piecing and hand quilting. Some of them are maybe piecing by machine, but hand quilting. They, they, they tend to want to hand quilt them. And I'm looking at from, I'm looking at the way Claudia's work is wrinkling on the right side. I'm going to think that her stuff is hand quilted as, as well. And um, probably not as much hand quilting because, you know, she looks, you know, she looks, she's a younger looking woman. She probably got some, she don't have time for that all the time. She gets, she got other things she got to do, going to do. And, but she is passing this on to her daughter, which you'll see on that top little picture. So that's a quick idea of G's Ben ladies. This, this is really skimming over them, but they became monetarily more sufficient. In this idea, I think that what happened with them when they got these exhibits, they were introduced to a whole nother world and they didn't even know their value. But once they knew their value, they started to fight back a little bit more to get their value, something called um, uh, residuals and, and licensing. You know, though they might've sold the quilt for what they asked for it, they had no understanding of these things. No one really told them these things. They learned it as time went on. So now I'm glad to say the people who are utilizing their style or utilizing their work are a lot more uh, clear about what they need to do for them, even as the first beginnings of stuff. There's a, um, there is a designer that has had the women create the quilt tops and he's made you know garments with them and he's put those ladies' names who made the quilt tops in the garments as part of the artistry of that garment. Um, there's another um, um, person that is working with them. You can actually buy one of, uh, one of the quilts, probably more of the younger women, but you can buy it on Etsy, Etsy the shop for creatives. Um, you can just uh, search G's Bend in there. You'll find people that have done things like the ladies of G's Bend. And we, you know, and I, I don't wanna call all of it cultural appropriation. We are all always, inspired by somebody, by other, the things that we, we see around us. Um, um, uh, I think a lot of people do, as they're inspired, try to give credit where credit is due. Some also do not. All right, so now we're gonna go quickly to uh, modern fiber. Our next slide, modern fiber artists. Okay, uh, this, this is a piece of mine. It actually was several things. It is not just, a quilt, it is actually also felt to the sky there and the uh, sidewalk there is actually hand uh, wet felted. And that's how I achieved those nice yummy colors in the sky. But the buildings were from me, what we call fussy cutting, 
cutting out little pieces of fabric that was already printed. It may have been printed to look like a window. It may have been printed to look like something else. The windows in the purple piece, they were printed to look like scales of a, of a, uh, of like a, an alligator or something. And, but I saw windows in it. So clearly I use it for that. So uh, uh, modern urban fiber artists, these women have grown up. We might've had roots in the South, but you will see, next slide. I have a friend, this is her work. I'm not gonna tell you what it is right now, but this is her work. And when I started making this presentation, I had to call her and say, well, were you inspired by the ladies of G's Bend? She said, no, she, 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 she's not even as familiar with them as I am. But as in her talking, she said it was kind of like that black girl kind of thing. She is putting them together in the same idea. She's just picking things she thinks look good to each other. She's starting out small. She's putting this next to that. The same exact way I've heard the ladies of G's Ben describe their process is part of her process. Next slide. And this is her work. This is Cassandra Brumfield. She, I'm proud to say this is a friend of mine. She is a designer. She is also a seamstress because all designers are not people who sew. Um, she's been doing this patchwork style since the 90s. Unless you knew G's Ben, you didn't know them in the 90s. You only would have known them from when they, when they surfaced uh, to mainstream, which would have been about 2002. And still you might not know them because if you know museum exhibits is not your thing, art is not your thing, quilting is not your thing, you might not know who they were. Okay, next slide. This is Cassandra. This is one of Cassandra's wedding dresses. It is pieced and patched silk, chiffon and um, organza. She does wonderful things. I'm so happy to own several of her garments. Um, she is from Brooklyn, New York. Well, she lives in Brooklyn, New York. I'm not sure where she originally hails from, but she lives in uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York. And uh, she is now trying to embrace the idea of considering herself an artist because she, she too thinks of herself as, as someone who definitely is a designer, but not necessarily in the idea of an artist. So uh, uh, the G's Ben ladies, I'm happy to report because somebody is there doing Etsy with them and, and their projects continually coming their way. They are able to make a better life as far as what money can buy, what money can buy. And sometimes, you know, who wants to go beat a shirt on a rock in the river when they can have a washing machine at home? Okay, that's my, that's my thing. All right, so we're gonna go to another artist, another friend of mine, Miss Sherry Shine, who has, gallery representation, has been able to take her quilting. She does a lot of her stuff, it's all applique, so you won't see as much patchwork of hers. Um, and uh, both Sherry and I have something, have an affinity for fabric, not just fabric that we can find, fabric that we can buy. So we see an interesting fabric, we might not have to work as hard because we found a fabric that can do that work for us. So Sherry has a couple of series, um, this is the People in the Field series, and you'll see um, in the background on the house, you'll see quilts uh, uh, hanging on that, um, that, that barn or that house. And she has, uh, you'll see her, her aesthetic is very much the aesthetic of today. Uh, next slide, where um, uh, she has something called the Green Book series. Uh, the Green Book, for those of you who don't know, was a book that um, African-Americans would have to let them know where they could stay as they traveled. As you know, every place was not hospitable to hosting African-Americans. Uh, we're gonna say, we're gonna say prior to the civil rights movement uh, and I'm sure, and definitely post it as well. So there was something called the Green Book that would let them know this place was black owned, this place was hospitable to people of different um, backgrounds um, that, that look different from everybody else. And so she has, she has her traveling people on their suitcases. And, um, and I say it's a modern aesthetic because very much you'll see the focus is the foreground, but the background that you see, all that curlicue you see in the back for her, that is not the fabric, that is her quilting. So she relies heavily now on the texture of the quilting, which doesn't translate as much in this, but um, that, is her, that is her dynamic. 
Okay, moving on to the next slide. Dinga McCannon. Uh, these two pieces are Dinga's work. Dinga, like myself, she learns something new and she brings it to the quilt. I think there might be some felting in one of these pieces. You'll see, you see uh, found objects in them. She loves to tell stories of, that, of lesser known history um, of African-Americans and just people of color. Um, the right is something that has to do with Mandela. The left is, oh God, I don't remember who that is. I think that is one of the track stars. That is, I don't remember, I don't have my notes on the side for that one. Um, we're gonna go, go to her next slide. This is a piece of dingus here. I know that a lot of that surface design on there is felted, but she is a quilter. She is also a painter. She's also a woodblock artist. Uh, she uh, started doing art in the 60s and um, is still working today. She was a Harlem artist at one point. She is now Hales in uh, Philadelphia, PA. And, um, and her career has skyrocketed, skyrocketed based on the auction of quilts that she no longer owned that has driven the value of her work up. And I'm so glad that she gets to see her work of the value of her work go up and monetarily gets to absorb some of that money because now her work is worth more. She can eat, she can now sell her work for more because of those sales. Um, and she gets to do it in her own lifetime. Okay, next slide. Another quilter. The quilt on the left, the Barbie, Barbie's America's Doll, that is um, uh, 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 one of her quilts. I believe that quilt is sold, but Kyra is also a documentarian and, and a writer and a book and a person who puts together books of other people's things. Um, Black Threads we talked about uh, the economics of Black quilters in the 90s. So that has a lot of stats in it. Um, the two books on the left, um, The Christmas Carol and The African-American Quilters, the artwork on the front is done by another African-American fiber artist slash painter slash a lot of other things named Francine Haskins, hails from DC. Um, uh, and um, so I, I get to, in that, in that um, slide I just showed, I get to pump two artists in one. Uh, I'm, the, last, the next slide I'm gonna show you is the Swan Gallery, a downtown gallery, not an African-American gallery, but a downtown gallery to all art that they can sell. Recently auctioned off the quilts of these three artists. I am so proud to say that I know all three of these artists and nothing there, I don't remember the sizes, but nothing there was under $20,000. Now, I don't know, I think those quilts also, that auction was of the artist's work. So some portion of that, a good portion of that goes to those artists. And Michael Cummings' all work already was selling for tens of thousands of dollars. And Dinga's work had already come to sell tens of thousands of dollars recently in the last five years. And now Kyra's work is now boosted up. Uh, so uh, that's uh, just putting in the idea of, well, could you as a person um, uh, make money off of this kind of craft? Possibly, and probably definitely. Can you ascend to the heights that I just discussed? I haven't yet. So, you know, you can go and get it. You Then you come back and you tell me how you did. Okay, and the last slide I wanna show you is gonna be our inspiration for next week. We are going to use Mary Jane Petway's quilt, and she is using a pattern called house, uh, half log cabins. Actually, it's a, a quarter log cabin, but I guess they called it half because you would be doing the pattern around another side. And I took one block out of that and I put it to the side. So this was done in a block piecing, but you'll notice that each block is very different. You'll notice that the way each block was, was achieved Sometimes the center was small or big. Sometimes the center square might've been several pieces. Um, sometimes the L shape around might've been the same two colors because that's how that is achieved. Um, the, uh, or sometimes it might've been just one color and another color is on the other side. So we're gonna explore that next week when you do your hands-on study. Um, you have received from Workforce 
a resource list. On that resource list, I have included books that I own. Uh, books, I would say that um, I enjoy digital everything, but I own books. Um, and uh, one is because sometimes it's easier to look at things from a book. Uh, 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 I just don't see getting rid of my collection of books just because things are digital and I actually seek them out. I was lucky enough to seek out a, a G's Ben book just because it had the content I wanted, but realized that I ended up with a signed copy of all of the G's Ben quilters who had work in that book and it was from the Austin Museum. And also from one of the Arnett's responsible for putting that show together, I have um, Bill Arnett's son's uh, autograph in that book as well. So, you know, just that was just by me collecting a, an extra, a, least, a less expensive book on Amazon. And, I, and that person just was selling a, a, a used book and I ended up with a gem, a jewel. Um, the other thing, as I would say, is some of the books that I have on my list, they are not, um, they, are, they are considered youth books, not children's books, but youth books. And don't shy away from that either, because sometimes you can get very much the same information in, in maybe easier terms. And also you can get a book that you can, it's hard to get a G's Ben book right now, unless you want to spend hundreds of dollars. Um, but they have a youth book that's only about $20, $30. So if you wanted to buy the book, that's more in the range of what you would buy. We still have our library system. And, um, and then there's some other books that you'll see there that, um, that may not be as, as expensive, especially for the Seminole quilting. Uh, and now I am going to open it up to anyone who has questions. We'll leave this last slide there and um, we'll open it up to any questions somebody might have. Now, I am not a historian. I am an artist who will study history to go along with what I do. So I might not have all the answers to it, but let me just say quickly, for the modern artists, I put their Instagram accounts and other Instagram accounts I found to be interesting do, um, that relate to things that I've talked about today. And I've also included not links, but search engine topics that you can search. So if you were searching on Amazon or Google or YouTube, because sometimes you don't have time to read the book. Somebody probably made a video. And I suggest you look, if you're trying to get down to the real truth of anything, look at more than one. And, uh, and uh, so I put that, that's all on, the, on that resource list, including what you need for next week. Um, I'll go, if we have a, a moment at the end, I'll talk about what we need for next week. Uh, but now I am finished. Or this is Howard. I think it would be a great thing to talk about next week. I think that would be, a, you know, what do you envision? And uh, I, I saw the resource list. Maybe mm -hmm. you want to go over it a little bit and kind of set us up and who, okay. who, who should do it. Okay. Who should do this? Well, now, since I've, I've um, introduced you to some and maybe exposed deeper to some others, the women of G's Ben, because they're their work is so intuitive, more so than just, just taught, but it's intuitive. And it's very free, in fact, that it it's, it's, doesn't have to be done by machine. I see seminal piecing as needing to be done by machine. I would not even teach it to anybody except by machine. But this, you can use, you can either go out and buy some fabric. Walmart sells, has a little section, a little aisle that has, that has fabric and scissors and things. But you don't need to leave your house for this. Um, you can actually, if you don't have a really good pair of scissors, you could use a knife and rip the fabric. You can use clothing that you were getting ready to discard. You can um, use uh, just about any fabric, but I'm suggesting that you stick to woven fabrics, which are more flat, like, like a cotton skirt, a cotton shirt. Um, uh, you could kind of do polyester double knit, but I, I don't want you to use too many stretchy things because sewing stretchy fabric can be something on its own. So on that resource list, by off the top of my head, you have a needle and thread. I remember originally uh, Michelle asked me, what size needle do you need? We're not going by convention. Whatever size needle is good for you, that size of the needle you should have. Whatever size needle you have. Maybe you don't have any money. You can just do this with what you have at home. 
whatever size needle you have. You also can go to your local Dollar Tree, Dollar General, 99 cent store, whatever that is. And they usually have a little sewing kit with pre-threaded needle. You can use that as well. And if you wanted to up your game later on as you've been exposed to this and now you're gonna seek it out on your own, you then could maybe you know get better tools. But clearly because these ladies started doing this with little to nothing, we're gonna start with, 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 you know, with the very basics. So you have a needle and thread. I always like to say the needle that you can thread is a good needle uh, uh, because if you can't see it to thread it, then it's not gonna do you a lot of good. But you have to remember that whatever's on the back of that needle gets pulled through the fabric and if it's too big, it becomes hard to pull. And you're gonna need to be able to pull that, that, that through. Those of you who do not already know how to hand sew, we're gonna go through it quickly. But the University of YouTube is real. And I will give you some buzzwords. If you wanted that, I'll say what stitch we're using. If we're using the running stitch, if you don't catch it from me, and you just sit the rest of your time just listening to how I progress in what happens next and what happens next, you can always go back to YouTube and somebody has put a video on there about how to do the running stitch. It's the most basic of stitches. But again, I can say things easy. If you don't know it, it's not easy to you yet. It will become easy to you, but it may not be easy to you for you yet. Um, a scissor. Um, in, 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 in fiber arts, we like to leave scissors specifically for that, like I, I have very nice scissors, they're fancy, they got a little enamel on them. But um, the biggest thing is how sharp the blade is. Paper dulls blades. So you usually, if you're a crafter, you won't use your paper scissor for what you use your fabric scissors with. But if that's all you have and don't intend on getting anything else, bring that scissor to the forum. Um, straight pins. And when I teach young people, I tell them the difference between a pin and a needle. A needle has an eye. It has a hole at the top. A pin has a head. It may have a big flowery plastic head. It may have only a little metal head, but it's a straight pin, not a safety pin, but a straight pin with a head. And I say, you need to understand that because if you go to somebody and ask them for pins and you come home, you will see that it doesn't have anywhere to put the thread. You're gonna be mad. So you gotta know the difference between a needle and a pin. So you will need needles and you will need straight pins. Um, uh, and the fabric is just, if you wanna buy something, then fine. But we're only gonna be doing something very small to get you started. We're going to do something that looks similar to what you see on the right side of, this, of, the, of the slide there. So, um, um, and that's a block. We may not get to the whole block because we're gonna go through it solely and I'm gonna reintroduce it for people who uh, have not gotten here, didn't get here for this introduction and are only coming for next week. Will we go over some of who G's Bend is and why their work looks the way it works, uh, looks the way it looks and how we're gonna move forward. So, so is that good? Well, I wanna also open it up to any questions. We had some folks that were asking some questions. This yes. is a good time to, to ask Laura anything you want about her presentation or, and uh, or if you want to just make a comment, you know, if you want to just say like me right now, this was unbelievably great. I had I want to go down and visit G's Bend. It's it looks there's apparently a whole tour, you know, driving tour that you can kind of go down there. It, it seems like an interesting area to go to. I, I, I'm, I'm right now I'm of the mindset that I want to do that. I'm actually going to be back in Alabama. I was in Alabama uh, actually last week. And I'm taking a class from a couple of G's Bend ladies in Alabama. This is Talladega. But uh, they are coming to Talladega to teach a quilting class. Anybody who feels like flying out to Alabama, that class may still be open. It's done, it is done by the Heritage House of Talladega. Heritage House of Talladega, I believe they have a website. Um, but they but they do do some things um, 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 in G's Bend. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna find out from them, and you know, should I have a chance to come back and expound on this some more? Uh, I will definitely tell you uh, what I found out. So, who has questions? Laura, there's a one question. If you don't mind me jumping in, um, sure. Howard, uh, did the Seminoles also weave their fabric? Uh, in this context, no, they did not. Um, that, that I found, no, they did not. Um, the Seminole, I'm gonna say the Seminole tribe 
was one of the tribes that they, they dealt with the United States back and forth as far as treaties and different things very early on and very close to them, which is why their garments look almost like they're from a prairie, like natives on the prairie. You know, mm -hmm. if you see traditional garb from other Native American tribes, you still will see feathers and skins. And if they go back and you're at a Native American powwow, you'll see them in their traditional stuff. The Seminoles were doing a lot of things uh, because the they were so close to each other, they had to be dealt with. And one of the reasons that um, the Trail of Tears, one of the one of the, the things that came up was what are we going to do about this problem in Florida? What are we going to do about the problem of runaway slaves? And it's very interesting if you do the research history of the African, uh, the Black Seminoles, you'll find out some, some interesting history that doesn't get talked about at all. It actually could have also been called a slave revolt because they, um, they were also linked to those people. They would kind of harbor those people. They would allow those people to have their freedom you know, somewhere close to them. So um, I think Andrew Jackson had a play in the Trail of Tears and there was somebody else there after that. And so um, I think because they were, they were, and they also they did things that um, they were making money off as far as trading crops with people, trading skins, trading exotic feathers, you know, for different things. Uh, I think they were purchasing there. I don't know. They had to have done something because everybody wasn't purchasing fabric back then. But if it was as far as a culturally iconic thing, they were not. If they were doing it, they were doing it like everybody else. And, and calico is stated as being one of the fabrics that they used. And so calico is not a Native American thing. That's a European thing. Right, right. Um, someone, Gail wants to know how large is the Seminole Africa quilt? Seminole Africa? Seminophora. We had uh, a, a size a size for it, and it was about. I'm looking at something else that's similar. It was about 30 by 40, 30 inches by 40 inches, or something like that. But mm -hmm. um, like a lot of my older work, I don't I, I, I don't own it. Okay, uh, yeah. is it safe to say that Martha Stewart brought them into mainstream? Them meaning the G's Ben Quilters. I don't think that's true. No, 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 no. They, they, because I'm going to say because they became icon, iconic and possibly mainstream through art, the art world, right? The museum goers, the gallery goers, the art collectors. This is how. And with Martha Stewart's brand being not just one of making, of selling products but also one of how to make things. It was a very good match. So they, you know, so different people who have seen, you know, a connection there have, 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 have helped to expose them. Jane Fonda worked heavily with the Arnett's to uh, have, um, uh, to, to, uh, to, bring, to bring them to the surface. Because, you know, in the art world, the art world is not inviting. You know, um, the whole idea, we get to charge a lot of money for things mm -hmm. because there are gatekeepers. There are gatekeepers at who can buy it. There are gatekeepers who, who can sell it. There are gatekeepers at who's going, who's going to showcase it. So, you know, to have people from a rural setting doing things that were natural to them, to this now not be craft or folk, to it now to be art, it's a big deal. And it doesn't always go over well. This kind of was able to slide through and I'm going to think it was able to slide through because it was elder black women. People didn't feel threatened in the art world like that, you know. Right. So, uh, 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 but when you had black males doing assemblage, they, 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 I mean, friends of theirs in the same community, they got a lot. The same Arnett and Jay got this, got a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback, and you don't know those names, and and they and and and, and even. Um, and, and you won't see their exposure except for in certain in certain circles of people who collect uh, the uh, rural African American art. Okay, um, Gail also wanted to know what are these quilts title? I guess she's referring to the G's Ben quilts. The G's Ben uh, quilts do have titles. A lot of times they will be they they won't have they won't have like uh, uh, any any big philosophical name or anything. 
they'll be titled something close to what they were doing. Um, some of them do. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm sure I could find the names. I did not include them in this because I knew I probably wouldn't get to them in that one hour I had. So I didn't always include them, but I know um, the particular work of Mary Lee Bendoff, I really love. Mm -hmm. And I actually wanted to get her to go down and sign a book of mine, go down, you know, see, cause she's in her nineties now. And, um, but the book that I bought came with her signature already in it. So if I go to G's Ben, I can go for something else. I don't have to go specifically for that reason. And she also wanted to know the title of the books. And those books are a part of your resource those, list. Bo right? Those books are on the resource list and the resource list, I'm sure everybody who signed up for this uh, presentation will, uh, will get. Yes. Um, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not extensive, but like I said, some of these books I bought knowing I was doing this, especially some of the seminal, um, simply seminal that's on that list is a book I had and I had done, uh, uh, some work, um, some seminal work with that book. And I think all these books are, 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 you know, um, except for the G's Ben books, G's Ben books tend to be from the two thousands up. These, the seminal books tend to be 1990s or before. So a lot of times you're going to end up with used copies of those and a used copy that that's the, the and you know, uh, uh, one thing I do like about, uh, well, for Amazon, I know does it, but any old bookseller, anybody who sells uh, 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 um, used books, they usually will put the condition of the book, possibly what's written in the book. For some reason, they're not saying sign, sign copies, maybe because I've never come across one that was, you know, somebody had looked at like that. They'll tell you, you know, what the binding looks like. Um, um, whether it has its jacket or not, that kind of thing. Um, but I know for the for the G's Ben, the big thick books, um, I have some elders. I'm going to say leave that book to me because I, 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 you know, I don't know that I want to spend you know the two hundred dollars it costs to get that book. Well, we've gone over a little bit, um, just by a few minutes, um, unless there's. Um, someone has a comment or a question they'd like to ask, we can kind of wrap this up. And and I, I know I need to go out and at least get the right kind of needle. <laughs> <laughs> your, your right kind of needle. Your right Correct. kind of needle. Yeah. <laughs> I, I suggest that everybody get a, a few different sizes because, you know, that way you can, if you've never really spent a lot of time sewing, you might not know what that is for you, but you you'll find out. And, and for anybody who's who's wearing glasses, definitely one that you can see the thread will be the best or those very inexpensive pre-threaded ones. Don't worry about the color right now. Go get those. They're already threaded. Yeah, I, I, I know we're not going to end up with um, with something like that's behind you, but just to, the experience of doing this, I think, is is really good. And I, I'm kind of thinking about those people that may have. Um, children who might want to experience this for the first time. This might be an interesting experience to, to have them try this at least a little bit. So, Yes, I think, I think so. I have taught young people, I think as young as the third grade, I was yeah. in a classroom. That sounds right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much, Laura. We're honored and can't wait till next week. Um, it's been absolutely um, eye-opening, uh, the amount, the beauty, and the incredible history that you've brought to us tonight. I'm very grateful to you. I'm grateful to Michelle, grateful to everyone that um, is in your world. I mean, it's an amazing world that you're exposing us to. Oh, thank you. I love it. I love it. Don't mind sharing it. Well, thank you, folks. We'll see you all next week. Good night. Thank you. Let's see if I can get this recording now. <laughs> see what happens.